four. Uh, in lesson four, we're going to talk about Boyle's law. So we have today we're going to have three laws that we're going to talk about. Okay, and then we're going to talk about the fourth one uh, that has is kind of special compared to all these. But uh, for this first one, we're going to talk a little bit about something called Boyle's law. In Boyle's law, it says this. If you have a sample of a gas and you change its volume at a consistent temperature, constant temperature, the pressure is also going to change. I'm going to draw you some diagrams that I would suggest drawing something like this as well. Pressure of the gas, we've talked about this before. How do we get pressure of a gas? Well, we talk about pressure between collision between molecules of a gas and the size of the container, whatever that happens to be. Okay? That's where pressure comes from. So since the temperature remains constant, you don't have to underline this part, I'd say, but there's no change in temperature. Therefore, if we're not changing the temperature, the molecules are moving still at the same speed, right? They're not speeding up, they're not slowing down, they're going at the same speed, whatever that is, okay? Boyle's law says this. This is we do need to know. If the volume goes down, by default, that means the pressure has to increase, okay? If we want the pressure to decrease, we have to make the volume larger, okay? So those are the two variables that basically Boyle's Law does. Pressure and volume, temperature is going to remain the same. There is a uh, relationship between pressure, volume, and temperature, and those are the three variables we're going to talk about today, all right? Now, what does that look like? Well, again, if I had some kind of a cylinder here, you can think about a, a, a cylinder in a car if you want, if that's what you can imagine or whatever. Or you can talk about whatever, some kind of a plunger si system that you have for cooking or something like that. Okay? If you have these two cylinders here and I push that one down, for example, and this one's still at the original height here, uh, let's say I have some, let's say I put five gas molecules in here, I don't know, just five, okay? And remember, in these two, I have five in here as well, I've just basically compressed those five. So, volume and pressure are the two things we're going to talk about. The temperature is constant. So, if the temperature is constant, that means in both of these cylinders, they should be moving at the same speed. Okay. In this example here, the volume is large. Okay. In this sample here, the volume is low. Okay. So, in our first container, obviously, you're going to have more space here. So, if you have more space between molecules, you're going to have Fewer collisions, yes? Correct? Fewer collisions. The fewer collisions you have, of course, means that the pressure is going to be low. We're not going to get that many collisions. So in this case here, the pressure is low. Okay? But, as Boyle's Law, Boyle's Law says, if I decrease the volume, so if I put those molecules, those same five molecules into a smaller space, there's going to be more collisions because there's less room for them to go, right? So they're going to bump into each other more often, et cetera, et cetera. The pressure is going to increase, okay? And that's what Boyle's Law basically says. In fact, there is this little bit of tidbit information for you as well. So listen closely and pay attention. We're going to get to this eventually. I'm just going to pretend you don't have to write that down, or if you do, if you want to, that's fine. I'm just going to say the volume of this cylinder is 2 liters. And I'm going to cut that volume in a half to 1 liter. What happens to the pressure? What do you think? It goes up, absolutely. Can you tell me anything else about the pressure? And this is important, especially down the road for your test. We're not, maybe not quite there. Well, we're there, I think. What would happen to the pressure if I halved the volume? What do you think? Obviously, that's all I'm telling you, so there has to be something going on here. What do you think? Anyone?
by how much? Yeah. Twice. Okay. So look, if I half the volume, the pressure is going to double. Yes. It is proportional. That is part of the formula that we're going to talk about right away here. But that's what happens. If I cut the volume by a third, the pressure will increase by a factor of three. Yes. If I take a quarter of the volume, pressure goes up by a factor of four. Okay. So we have to kind of keep that in mind that there is a formula here. That there is a relationship between pressure and volume. It's what we call, I guess, maybe inverse. In other words, as the pressure goes up, the volume has to go down, right? The more the pressure goes up, the more the volume goes down directly, uh, sorry, not directly, uh, indirectly proportional, okay? So that's what's happening here. Yeah, the pressure would double. I'm taking the same number of molecules, but I'm giving them half the space, so they should, should collide twice as often, yes? Because I have half the space available to them, okay? So let's keep that in mind as we go forward. I think you guys already have the graph for this. You need to know the graphs. You guys have pressure here, I think, in volume. Is that right? Okay. So that's what the graph of boiled wall looks like. Make sure you know that. Star it. Make sure you know. You should also know that Boyle's Law is actually this formula here. It does pressure and volume. P1, V1 equals P2, V2. And temperature has to be the same, constant. The temperature has to be the same. You'll notice there's no T's in this formula. The system is closed. No gas can escape. Okay? What is P1, V1 equals P2, V2? What does that mean? It just basically means this. These are the initial set of conditions. And these are the final set of conditions. Okay? So sometimes, actually, in textbooks and things like that, you will, in textbooks and other materials, you'll see that it says PIVI, initial, PFVF, final. Okay? Same thing here. P1V1 equals P2V2. Initial set of conditions. What do I start? Where does gas start? And then where, what would it be when I'm, when I'm done with this, when I change it? Okay? Initial equals final. And that's basically what we're doing for examples today kind of thing. Okay, that's it. Okay, it's a pretty simple formula for the most part. Good? Okay. It's initial versus final. Okay, next. Um, okay. This year, basically, we have to also talk about this a little bit because this is going to involve our first lab as well, eventually. Um, whenever you have two gases, Okay, if I left this cylinder out, and this, this disc here, by the way, is free-floating, so this disc is allowed to move up and down somewhat freely. You have to be on a, you know, it has to be a certain apparatus for that to happen, where it's able to move down and up and down, and of course this doesn't collapse. But if you pump some gas into the bottom here, okay, basically what it's saying is the outside pressure has to equal the inside pressure. Because if the two aren't equal to each other, okay, and the disc is going to move up and down until they are equal to each other, yes? Okay? And that's what happens here. If you are applying a big force on the outside of this, you can pretend that you maybe you put a weight on there, okay, on this uh, disc. So maybe you put a 10-pound weight on the outside. Well, guess what? The disc is going to go down until what? It equals this, right? And this is an example of Boyle's Law. The volume in here, this is going to keep decreasing, decreasing, decreasing down here. So this part's going to decrease. It's going to keep moving down that disc until there's enough collisions to create the same pressure. Yeah. Okay. That's called like equilibrium, basically, right? Where the outside is equal to the inside. Okay. Back and forth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Good. Uh, another example of this, in a way, if we're going to talk about equilibrium, things need to kind of balance out, okay? And, and that's a little bit of what we're talking about, but let's talk about uh, bicycle tires for a second. Who's, who's ever pumped up a bicycle tire? Who's pumped it up from scratch, like from like when it was completely flat and you had to change the tube 
and then put the bicycle tire on and then start pumping it up. Yeah? Okay. What happens when you first start pumping up a bicycle tire? Hard? Easy? With the, not with the compressor, that's easy. I'm talking about like good old fashioned hand pump. It's easy, right? Because the force that you're applying to this tire, this tube, is way more than what's in the tube, yes. So I start pumping them up, guess what? I have four fat bike fire, four back fat fire. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I have four fat bike tires I need to change. We'll bring them in, we'll do this. I'll watch you change bicycle tires. How's that? I'll drink coffee. Sound good? Sounds like, no, it's fun. Are they tubeless? Sounds like no, tubeless. they're not tubeless. They have the tube still. Uh, to be honest, in the winter time, it's probably too much of a hassle. I, I can make them tubeless, but I don't want to. Our, our regular mountain bikes are tubeless. But these ones, I, I, I've thought about it a few times, and it's, it's meh. I, you don't really, I don't think you save a lot of weight by the time you put all the sealant in and stuff. I don't think it's going to save time. Yeah, it's whatever, it is what it is. Um, but anyway, I have four of those. When you start pumping up the tube and it's got no, nothing in it, it's super easy, right? The bicycle, or even a bicycle tire. You put the tube in, you put the tire around it, and you start pumping it. It's super easy, right? If you do it with one hand, super easy, right? In fact, I do that and I have a coffee in one hand and I have a, and I pump it for a while. But then eventually what happens? It gets harder, right? Because now the pressures are starting to equalize a little bit, right? So now inside the tube is maybe 20 PSI. And I can't do 20 PSI with just one hand anymore. So I have to start using two hands. I gotta put my coffee down. So then I start using two hands and I start pumping again. And we get up to 30, okay? Or 35 or 40 or whatever it is. I don't know, how much do you run in the tire? I don't know. About 80. 80? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, no, I know. But not much, eh? Okay. Okay, when I never run that much. That's a lot. That is a lot, but they have to have good rolling, right? Yeah. They have to be, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a lot. Okay. Um, so, you know, you start getting up, you get to 30, you get to 40 maybe even, but it gets, it starts to now become very difficult, yes? And you are trying to fight against 40. So you're putting in, if you put in 40 PSI of pressure and it's already got 40, what happens? Nothing, right? In fact, if you get to that magical spot where you can't pump anymore, like you're not strong enough to get another PSI in, you push down on the thing and you know what happens, right? You get to that point, if you've ever done this before, you get to the point and it just won't, it won't go down. And then you let off of it and it actually pops back up, right? And that's because the pressure that you're putting into it is equal to the pressure that's inside the tire. If you want to put in more, you've got to really put in more pressure Right? You've got to maybe put your whole body on top of it to get another PSI in or two PSI to overcome that, right? That's because the pressures are equalized. And that's what's happening here. The pressures have been equalized now, right? Through kind of, I guess, in a way, through putting more gas molecules in, I guess, but, but pressures become equalized. And if you want to get to 80, you can't do that with a hand pump, right? I, sometimes you do. It takes a long time. It does. Yeah. And it's pretty tough. It's a lot of work. So then you get a just compressor and you just do it by a compressor stage, right? But even my truck, for example, has yeah, it, it can hold eighty PSI. The tires it's a heavy heavy duty, it's got uh, big tires on it, and it holds eighty PSI. If I only have forty PSI in the tank, it won't do anything. You can take the compressor, even though it's mechanical and all, it's got forty PSI in there. And you can put it on the truck tire and just sit there and put it on there and you can hear, you will hear nothing. Nothing happens. Because inside has already got 60, for example, and there's only 40 in the tank. It's not enough to overcome that. So nothing happens. If anything, maybe just a little bit leaks out before you make that seal kind of thing. Nothing happens. So you have to go plug it in, make sure it ramps up to like 120 PSI, and then go back and you can then add some more PSI but you have to overcome that equilibrium, yes? So that's kind of what, that's a little bit what goes on here, but we just, when I talk about the equilibrium, I'm talking about the outside has to equal the inside. When we go to the gap, when we go to the lab, 
Our first lab is going to be a, uh, a gas lab, and we're going to talk about the atmospheric pressure outside compared to the atmospheric pressure inside. Okay? And those two have to equal out. Those two are equal. Okay? 